Hello everyone. Paper two is coming up. It's on Monday. Um, as from when I'm speaking, if you're watching this afterwards, then probably you're looking at it from next year's point of view. Um, but in any case, here's a little bit on one of the Christianity topics from year one. So I'm going to take a look at, at good conduct and key moral principles. This topic's not too bad. There's there's a lot in it, but most of it is straightforward. I'm actually going to start today with the bit that isn't so straightforward, which is this concept of justification. So let's have a little look. All right. Justification is all about do you get to go to heaven or not? So it comes from a Greek word um, and it essentially means being counted. Justification, if you're justified, that means do you count? And when I say do you count, we're talking about being counted by God as being one of the good people, one of the righteous people deserving of heaven. But it gets tricky because some Christians don't think this has anything to do with being a good person at all. They think it's all up to God. But if it isn't up to God, if it, if it is about how you behave and therefore that influences what God decides about you, Possibly it's not 100 percent up to God. It's partly up to you. And that's got big implications for good moral conduct. Does how you behave in your life influence whether or not you go to heaven? There's no agreement about that in Christianity. Some people say, yes, it matters a lot. Others say, well, it matters, but it's nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven. So we've got some different points of view that we're going to work through. Um, Justification might be by faith, it might be by works, or in one kind of formulation put forward by the Catholic Church, it's kind of both. So I'll take you through that as best as I can. And then we've got to look at this slightly tricky concept of predestination as well. This is the idea that not only is it only God who decides, but actually it goes a step further and says that God has already decided. God already knows who is going to heaven and who isn't. Let's start with justification by faith. So we find this in various areas of Christian thinking. We find it a little bit in Paul's writings. And this is essentially the idea that you can't do anything to get to heaven. Whether you go to heaven or not is not up to you. It couldn't be because nobody is ever good enough. Nobody is ever going to live up to the standards needed to actually deserve eternal life in heaven. So if we if that's the case, then the only way it can happen is if God gives it to us. And this is where we use this word grace. So through God's grace. A person can be justified. God can choose to save you. Now, it's not the case that having faith kind of gets you a ticket. Because, you know, by believing God sees that and then he decides to save you. God saves whoever he wants. And God can save everybody or God can save nobody. But it's the idea that your faith is what really matters far more than your works, because nobody could ever earn their way into heaven. So let's break it down a little bit more. This argument essentially goes that you're justified because your faith is a response to the gift of grace. So if you kind of enter into this relationship with God, who you believe loves you enough to save you, you are therefore justified. But confusingly, it's not cause and effect. It's not like you decide to have faith and then God saves you. God offers you this gift of grace and through your faith, you accept it. It isn't dead straightforward. But essentially, the important bit is that God saves you as a gift of love that you don't deserve because nobody ever could deserve it. And because it's not to do with whether you deserve it or not, it can't really be anything to do with good moral conduct. So we've got a little bit of St. Paul. We've also, we've also got Martin Luther, not to be confused with Martin Luther King. Luther is one of the Protestant Reformation guys, and he believed in this idea of soul of fide. So we are saved by faith alone. So good conduct, good behaviour, good moral actions, they may be an expression of someone's faith. If someone's truly got Christian faith, 
you would expect to see them behaving well as a kind of made, a way to make that real in their lives. But it's got nothing to do with whether or not they go to heaven. It does nothing to save them because you can't earn your way into heaven. If any of you have seen The Good Place, which I know a lot of you will have, and a massive shout out to The Good Place because it's a great show. In The Good Place, there's kind of like this idea of a point system that, you know, every good act you do gets you points towards going to the good place and every bad act you do gives you bad place points. This is kind of the opposite of that. This is saying that, you know, it can't possibly be like that because only God can save. There's nothing we can really do in our behaviour to control whether we are saved or not. If we behave well, it's because we believe we are saved. It's not to get saved. Hopefully that makes sense. Justification by works is the idea that actually it does have something to do with your moral conduct. And there's quite a bit of evidence for this in the Bible, particularly the New Testament. So it's heavily based on this idea that faith without action is dead. So this is in the letter of James. And the argument is essentially that, you know, if you see somebody who's cold and hungry, praying for them is not going to warm them up or feed them. You actually have to do that. Saying, you know, I've, I feel sorry for you, I'll pray for you. That actually does nothing for a person. So you have to back up your faith with actual deeds. Otherwise, your faith doesn't really mean anything. It's also based on the parable of the sheep and the goats, which I'm sure you all know. In that story, Jesus seems to make it clear that people are judged on their behaviour towards others. So I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you visited me. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Those people are the sheep. They're the ones who are saved. The goats are the people who didn't do that. So many people are therefore convinced, many Christians, that there is a connection between good behaviour and being saved. We've also got it in the Sermon on the Mount. So this is in Matthew's Gospel. Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father. So you actually have to do something. You have to live your faith through your life and through your choices. Is it possible to have it both ways? Yes, sort of. So this is a Catholic response. And this came about um, at the Counter-Reformation, which was kind of the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation, so the Catholic response to people like Luther. God's gift of grace is what, justify us, or what justifies us, but the power of the Holy Spirit is what enables people to live good lives. And living a good life is important, because if God saves you, but then you don't live a good life, why has God saved you? So yes, it's saying that faith is very important, and our faith is a response to God's gift of grace. But living a good life is part of the process. So it all kind of has to come as one package. Now, going against this, we have this idea of predestination. This is the idea, if you break down the word predestined, is that your, your destiny is already decided. If you can hear a noise in the background, that's my cat. It's based on the view that God is omnipotent and omniscient. So it's trying to be a little bit logical. It's saying that God can save whoever he wants because he's omnipotent. And because God is omniscient, God already knows who is saved and who is not, because God literally knows everything. Now, there's a bit in Paul where it's not quite clear whether he's a supporter of predestination or not. He does imply that God has already decided he's justified. But we don't really know what he meant. And it could just mean that God's omniscience means that he already knows what people are freely going to choose. So he's not making the choice for them. He's just seeing what choices they make. That's not the same thing. St. Augustine said that God does predestine some to heaven, that it's God's will. It can't be understood by humans, but that God does this infallibly. Infallible was the word he used. And that means that whatever God does, it's the right thing. So we have to just kind of be OK with that. Now, Calvin, who's the guy in the picture, he came quite a lot later. He went further 
and came up with this idea of double predestination. So God decided in the beginning, even before creation, who would be saved and who would be damned. And Calvin's view is just that we kind of ought to be grateful if anybody is saved because we're all so sinful. We're all tainted by original sin. So if God saves anybody, that's an enormous act of grace and love and we should be grateful for it. So Calvin's got a pretty bleak view of human nature there. And as you're about to see, not terribly popular today. So there are quite a lot of problems with predestination. A massive problem with it is if we're all predestined, if it's all already decided who's going to heaven and hell, how can there be any significance to our moral conduct? Why would we bother trying to be good if it has nothing to do with whether we're saved or not? There's another big problem in Calvin's thinking particularly. If he's right, then what God has done is he has created people for the sole purpose that should say some, God created some people, specifically to send them to hell for eternity, and they would not be able to do anything about that. That seems very, very unjust. That seems not to be compatible with the view of a loving God. And then finally, if God already knows, if God already has this knowledge of who is saved and who is damned, this has got big implications for free will. If God already knows right now whether we're going to heaven or hell, to what extent are we free? To what extent are we really in charge of our choices? Are our choices real? OK, that will do on that one. Hopefully I've been clear. My head's a bit fuzzy today. I'm struggling with hay fever. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. All the best for paper two. Keep going. Final push. Um, I'm not going to have a huge amount of time to do loads more videos this week. I will try and do a few. If there's anything you want specifically, let me know and I'll do my best, but no promises. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. See you.